Well, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker tonight. Uh, he is also a radio show host, and I'll let him give you the details on that. And uh, so here you have it, Mr. Jack Otto. Thank you, friends. 65 years ago today, God Almighty put me on this earth, and I believe it's to fight against this new world order. Thank you, and happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. We are being cornered like cattle into a pen, squeezed down, and we're never really going to be free people unless we're brave. Because this was only the land of the free as long as it was the home of the brave. And this started a long time ago with people that go back to the well, fourth century. Let me tell you about the flight of the Khazar warriors out of northern Turkey in 500 AD. They were a despicable bunch. You could go to the king of the Khazars and rent an army from him an army of 40 or 50,000 men, but it didn't matter what kind of a deal you struck with their monarch. He wasn't called a king, he was called a shagan. Once the battle was done, they rape and pillage. Doesn't matter what kind of agreement you had with the king, that's the way it ended up. And so as a consequence, people in the area garnered a great deal of animosity for these Khazar warriors. And in 500 AD, they were driven out. And as they came down south out of uh, Turkey, some fled to the west into Romania and Hungary and became the gypsies. The rest followed their monarch, the Chagan, up into the steppes of Russia uh, and north of there to the uh, Caucasus Mountains. And as they settled in there, they relatively well, they quite easily enslaved the relatively peaceful agrarian Slavic folks that were indigenous to the area. Then they came under pressure to take sides in a growing contention around them. Coming down from the north was Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and coming up from the south was Islam. And they knew that if they succumbed to pressure from either of those to join their organization and embrace their philosophy, it would surely offend the other. And so what they did was a politically expedient maneuver. He called in all the religious leaders of the area and he got their input and after the input he announced for me and my people, and we're talking about 20 million people and about 4,000 nobility, for me and my people, we choose to become Jews. Now, this was not a heartfelt conversion. This was not something that was deep in their breasts that they felt they needed to uh, make a conversion because they thought that was the proper way to serve the Creator. This was something that was done as a political expediency. And in the course of studying about their new religion, and you do have to study it even if you're only going to charade, it is absolutely necessary to study about it so that you can fake it. And in the course of doing so, they came across a character with whom they could truly identify. It was Lucifer, the morning light that fell from grace and became Satan, the adversary. And they formed an inner circle within Judaism dedicated to the forces of evil. Let's define terms. What is a Jew? If you look back in your Old Testament, your Bible, there was 12 Hebrew tribes. The 10 northern tribes were called the House of Israel. The two southern tribes were called Benjamin and Judah, more properly pronounced Judah, because we didn't get the harder sound to the J until about 200 years ago. So this is what I would call real Jews, people from the tribe of Judah. And when we start talking about the New World Order, we are not talking about these people at all. We're talking about these Khazar warriors that only pretended 
to embrace Judaism. And so today, we find that about 92% of the people who claim to be Jews really aren't. They don't have a drop of Semitic blood in their veins. They are Khazar warriors with a new bent on life and a goal to conquer, to rape, and to pillage. And that philosophy has come down over time and we see how effectively they have implemented it throughout history. Now, when they pretended to embrace Judaism, they drew upon the real Jews for some education. And they used the Hebrew alphabet as phonics to codify their Khazar language. And so now we look at that language called Yiddish or Zhidish and find that it is not Hebrew. It only appears to be. Now these people have run into some trouble over time. In 965 AD, they were overrun by the Varganians, which was Swedish-ruled Slavic people. Varganian is the Russian word for Vikings. And they were militarily defeated, which curbed their expansionist philosophy for some time. And then in 1140, they were literally overrun by the Mongols for uh, Kublai Khan and Genghis Khan and they were driven down into Eastern Europe. Their monarch, the king, or Chagan as he was called, fled to um, Spain and Portugal. Now, because these folks were a, a darker uh, skinned people with black hair and brown eyes, it was easier for them to fit in with the folks of Spain and Portugal and Italy and Sicily than they could other places where they stood out and looked markedly different. And they took a great deal of control, in, especially in Spain and Portugal, so much so that they were discovered in conspiracy because they worked together to get themselves, one of them, into a position of authority where that person can work in tandem with others to get more of their people in the authority and positions of power and working it up to where they're running the show and milking everybody else. After they fled down into Europe, there was one of them, a guy by the name of Meyer Amschel Bauerberg, who decided to enter into clandestine world government. Meyer Amschel Bauerberg used the symbol outside of his father's silversmith shop, a large red shield, as inspiration for an alias. And he went by the name of Rothschild. That's German language for red shield. Now Rothschild was born in 1743 and when he was in his late 20s, he formulated a financial enterprise with 12 other entrepreneurs with the dedication, with the interest and the intent of conquering everybody and everything. They were going to do it with fractional reserve banking, and that turned out to be a very successful tool. We found out about fractional reserve banking at the Bank of Amsterdam in 1610 when, like all fiat money inflations, it came to a roaring bust. And they learned from that and wanted to implement it wherever they could so that they could be the ones that profited from, benefited from that enterprise. Now, Meyer Amschel Bauerberg had five sons, and he took these five sons, and as they became of age, he sent them to foreign countries to operate not an independent banking system, but one in conjunction with the rest of their people, a system whereby Nathan, who went to London and soon proved himself to be shrewd, 
There was one named Coleman who passed himself off as Carl, and I think he went to Amsterdam. Uh, Jacob called himself James in Paris. And we find that throughout the world, in five big locations, they had banking institutions that had a very clever idea. And if these people weren't so evil, it would have been easier to admire what they did. But they had a system whereby you could go to one of the banks in one country and deposit gold with them and get a receipt for it. And then go to the foreign country where they had another office, take that receipt and get your gold. And you didn't run the risk of losing your gold on the high seas, either to wind or to pirates or anything else. So in a way it was kind of a, a clever scheme, however. Uh, these people were despicably evil and their intent to make money was to not just put themselves for their head, but to hold others back. Now, Meyer Amschel Bauerberg uh, lived to be, uh, well, he lived from 1743 to the year 1812, and that's why we got that 1812 overture was to honor him. His associates respected him and wanted to salute his passing. Meyer Amschel Bauerberg changed his name to Rothschild and he also dropped the Bauerberg suffix and called himself Bauer closer to home where he lived there at 148 Judenstraße in Frankfurt, Germany. They later moved down to 148 Judenstraße and it was from there that he was able to do much of his chicanery and he got in league with a guy, William the Ninth of Hesse Castle. Now, if you remember about the Hessian warriors, the Hessian warriors were something that were uh, warrior slaves that was purchased by the King of England from this landgrave of Hesse Castle. It would, they were purchased for the price of twelve thousand dollars. And much of that money was earned by just capturing these people uh, through actual out-and-out -out brigand slavery and holding them until they could be sent to the king, and which they were told, don't ever let those colonists get a hold of you. They will skin you alive. Well, when the Hessian uh, soldiers got captured by one of us, and they, one of our forefathers, they started crying, oh, please don't skin me. And they said, well, skin you? We're not going to do that. Then they realized they had been lied to. Many of them came over and joined the revolutionary forces of the Americans, and a lot of them escaped out to the West and melded in and became um, what we might call squatters out there in the wide open West like the rest of us did. Now, they did a pretty good job of interfacing with the Native Americans out there and were able to garner some respect for them. So it was among these same people that brought about so much of the war that we see in front of us throughout history. It was fomented primarily for profits and to scare us into believing that the only way that we could circumvent this war to get this behind us is if we were to form a league or united nations. Now the first attempt was when they had their man Napoleon. Now Napoleon was the Emperor of France but he came from Corsica and it was shortly after Corsica was brought into the French Empire that he was given the nod to become the emperor and to engage his war. Now this was shortly after that French Revolution. You know I'm going to go back and take a step back here and talk about that French Revolution for a moment. See it was shortly after there, a man named Adam Weishaupt in May 1st of 1776 formulated an organization called the Illuminati. This was done on behalf of Baron Rothschild and it was for the express purpose of fomenting their plans and 
uh, executing their goals uh, for conquest. Now, Adam Weishaupt 